Next up is Life PTY Limited. So Life PTY Limited is a resident company with a September year end. So it means their tax year runs from the 1st of October till the 30th of September. Live holds 6% of the shares in American Made Accessories, a company which is situated in the United Kingdom. Wow, that's ironic. American and then in the UK. But here's we go. So it's 6% of the shares in the shares in a foreign shares. Right. Now, remember guys, I'm pointing it out to you because 6% of the shares is less than 10%. When you have 10% of the shares, when you receive things like foreign dividends, you can get 100% in the frequent exemption. On the 1st of June of the current year, AMA declared and paid a dividend to its shareholders. Life received a gross dividend of £25,000. Okay, so that is um, a foreign dividend. And then says the United Kingdom usually withholds dividends tax equal to 20% of the gross dividend paid. However, LIFE submitted all the necessary documentation for AMA to comply with the double tax agreement between South Africa and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The relevant extract from the double tax agreement is provided below. Okay, so let's see what the double tax agreement says. Now what's important for you guys to, to note here when we're looking at things like the double tax agreement is that um, they say they always refer to a contracting state and then an other contracting state. Those are the two that you see. So the contracting state and the other contracting state. Now, in this case, it's between South Africa and the UK. Now, you could, if the South Africa is the contracting state, then the UK is the other contracting state. But it could also be that the UK is the contracting state and South Africa is the other contracting state. You have to read it in the context of the agreement, so we'll have to figure that out. Now, what you'll see, what I recommend that we do, is I recommend that we call the contracting state A and the contracting, other contracting state B. And I mark it like that, so A, B, A, B, in the following manner. I find that this is an, an, maybe a, a useful way of reading it if you're struggling with it. So it says, dividends paid by a company which is a resident of a contracting state to a resident of the other contracting state may be taxed in the other state. So let's reread it now. Dividends paid by a company which is a resident of A to a resident of B may be taxed in B. Okay, so let's quickly now, right at this point, already think about something. What happens here? A company in the UK paid a dividend to a resident of South Africa. So it says, dividends paid by a company which is a resident of the contracting state. What was that company a resident of? The UK. So A is the UK in this case. So A is the UK and B must then be South Africa. Okay, so let's just bear that in mind. I'm going to continue calling it A and B, A and B, but it's just easier, but already you can see where it's going. So I'm going to reread it just quickly with South Africa and the UK. Dividends paid by a company which is a resident of the UK to a resident of South Africa may be taxed in South Africa. So they say that dividends may be taxed in South Africa. However, such dividends such shall be exempt from the tax in the contracting state of which the company paying the dividends is a resident. So, okay, A. If the resident of the, if the beneficial owner of the dividends is a company, so in this case it is a company, which is a resident of the other contracting state, so um, B, and controls directly or indirectly at least 10% of the voting power. Okay, so see now what it says. So it says, I'm going to start here, Queen. Dividends paid by a company which is a resident of the UK to a resident of South Africa may be taxed in South Africa. However, su such dividends shall be exempt from the tax in 
the UK, of which the company paying the dividends is a resident, if the beneficial owner of the dividends is a company which is a resident of the other contracting states of Africa, and controls directly or indirectly at least 10%. So they're saying if you pay it to a company, or if the shareholder is a company which life is, and it holds at least 10% of the shares, then it's exempt. But this is 6%. So this doesn't apply. Then B, except as provided in subparagraph A, so they say, yeah, of this paragraph, it may also be taxed in the contracting state of which the company paying the dividends is a resident. So it may be taxed in A, the UK, um, of which the company is paying a resident. And according to the laws of that state, so they're still talking about A, but if the beneficial owner of the dividends is a resident of the other contracting state, so, so B, South Africa, the tax so charged shall not exceed 15% of the gross amount. So they say, the UK, they say, yeah, what they say first here is they say, tax by, paid by a resident, uh, a company in the UK to a resident of South Africa may be taxed in South Africa. So that means that we can include it in our gross income. You're right, we can say that it must be included in gross income. It's not excluded, and then it, but, but it can also be taxed. They say here then, um, in the UK, because they say it may also be taxed in the UK. But if it, that person who it's being paid to, if life is a resident of South Africa, then it can't be more than 15% the tax paid in the UK. So the UK usually wants to withhold 20%, but the double tax agreement says limited to 15%. So this means foreign dividend, there was foreign tax on that as well, of 25,000 pounds times 15%. And if there's foreign tax on it, it means you have to consider Section 6 quad. Alright, and then they give us some exchange rates, spot and average exchange rates. Right, why are they doing it for us? Well, we need to use these spot ones to translate those amounts we receive, but we use the average for Section 6 quad. Then we've got Lerata Boyane. Lorato is 23 years old and a resident of South Africa. She is currently enrolled at UNISA for a CTA and working hard to work course qualifying as a CA. Lorato is currently completing her training contract at a mid-sized auditing firm. As a trainee, she works a lot of overtime and she has requested permission to work from home after hours and the employer has agreed. Lorato's flat has only one bedroom which she uses to use as a home office after hours. Lorato already had a desk in the room because she does to play computer games before bed each night. When using the desk for work, she just pushes the desktop computer aside. Lorata has provided you with the following picture of her home office. Right, there's the bookcase, a uh, personal computer of a desk, and her bed. All right. Lorata has calculated that the bedroom makes up 45% of the total flat, and she wishes to claim 45% of the following expenditure. Water, electricity, rates and taxes, and a monthly bond repayment. And they tell you it's interest on this. So the monthly bond is capital plus interest. Now, you can claim water electricity rates and taxes and interest in terms of section 23b, the home office section. This is the section that actually tells you that you can't claim home office, but then it tells you you can claim home office experiences. However, it must be used regularly plus exclusively as a home office. Plus, it must be specifically equipped. Now, she's a trainee, so maybe this is specifically equipped, so we can maybe say that. But it's not used exclusively as a home office. Her bed's in there. A personal computer is in there, which she plays games on. Right. Another requirement here is if you, if, you, if you earn commission, it's fine. Then you have to be working also from home. If you don't earn commission, if you earn a salary, then your duties must be mainly performed. In from the office. Now, if you go back here, they tell you she's only working after hours, so there's also a problem there. So, section 23b, nope, sorry, she can't claim it. 
So then we have Jamil Khan. Jamil Khan is a resident of South Africa and he's 52 years old. Three years ago, he created the Khan Trust. The beneficiaries of the trust are members of his family, being Dina, Niran, and Hirsha. Dina is his wife. Jamil is his 18 year old son, so that's not a minor anymore. And Hirsha is his 71 year old mother. Jamil donated several assets to the trust three years ago, okay? So that means section 7 should be considered. The only one potentially we can see here is um, to his wife, but then there would have to be some sort of um, tax benefit that she gets from it. On the 1st of September of the current year, he gave an interest-free loan to the trust. Okay, that's concerning, section 7C. This was to help the trust pay for several expenses and to purchase additional assets. Jamil did not specify maturity date for the loan. On the 15th of December, Niran uh, turned 18, okay, so that's when he, so he was a minor before then. And he donated his personal vehicle to his son. All right, so that's, also, that's a donation there. A market-related interest is 10%. The repo rate for the, is 7% for the entire year. Okay. Section 7C, we have to use the official rate of interest, which is calculated as the repo rate plus 100 basis points. 100 basis points um, is 1%. So it's 8%. Okay. So... For donations tax, the order is important. Right, there's two donations, section 7C and the donation. Which one happens first? This happens on the 1st of September and this on the 15th of December. So it looks like this is number one and this is number two, right? But remember, section 7C says is treated as uh, deemed at last day of the year is when that one is tried to take place. So this will be section 7C and this will be the motor car to, to son donation. It's in that order it will take place. Okay, and that's it.